We are thankful to the ITA group for their investment in this speaker series, but more importantly, for their understanding of the need to not only create the space to engage in these important dialogues and conversations, but to bravely and intentionally create a new and different narrative aimed at creating an inclusive and more equitable Des Moines. I'd also like to take a moment to thank the Greater Des Moines Partnership for co-hosting Conversations in Color. I am joined today by Becky Miles Polka, Senior Consultant with the Campaign for Grade Level Reading, who will co-facilitate today's conversation. Thank you, Becky, for being with us today. COVID is making a strong attempt to alter the course of education as we know it. The public education was not built to deal with extended shutdowns like those imposed during the pandemic. Districts across the state of Iowa went from COVID slide in March of 2020 to the traditional 10 week summer slide. And now students and teachers are experiencing the yo-yo effects of virtual and hybrid learning and the potential for yet another slide in academic performance. Recent studies suggest that the coronavirus will undo months of academic gains, leaving many students, especially poor, minority, and special education students behind. To help us explore the challenges of education in the COVID era, we have invited Ralph Smith, Managing Director of the Campaign for Grade Level Reading Annie E. Casey Foundation, and also a senior vice president. Before we get to Ralph, we'd like to share with you a quick video, and then we'll do introductions and move on with our conversation. is no stranger to Des Moines and Iowa, having spent time in the past with the foundation's Iowa Making Connections work, and now with the folks throughout the state who are part of the Iowa contingent for the campaign for grade level reading. Ralph is a former attorney who has spent the better part of the past 10 years as the managing director for the campaign for grade level reading, forging consensus around ensuring that children reach that critical milestone of reading on grade level by the end of third grade. Today, in this conversation, Ralph will share with us background on the campaign, the impact of COVID on K-12 education, the role of schools in community, lessons learned, best practices in the field, and finally, we'll leave time to respond to questions that members of our audience have. I want to again welcome each of you to today's conversation in color. And I'd also like to welcome my co-facilitator, Becky Miles Polka, and our guest presenter today, Ralph Smith, Senior Managing Director, Grade Level Reading. Welcome, Becky, and welcome, Ralph. Thank you both for being with us today. Terry, I am so delighted uh, to see you and to join you. Uh, and to be back in Iowa, even though virtually. <laughs> I, I miss uh, my visits to Iowa and can hardly wait until this particular form of prot protective custody that we're <laughs> all in uh, evaporates so that I could get back on the road. Not as much as before, but I promise you I'm coming back to Iowa. 
I, right. I'm delighted to have uh, the opportunity to share the conversation uh, with Becky Miles Polka. Uh, as you know, Becky, Becky has been invaluable to the campaign, not only as the intrepid leader of the Iowa campaign for grade level reading, but also as a member of the senior team for the national campaign and as one of the people upon whom we depend for clear, good, candid advice. And those of you who know Becky, know Becky had, is literally the steel fist in the velvet glove. She always tells the truth, whether you want to hear it or not. And I'm delighted to share uh, this program with her. Great. And what Thank I'd you. like to do um, is really to begin talking about the campaign for grade level reading and our mission because our mission is to disrupt generational poverty. And in saying that, people are stunned because so many people want us to talk solely about grade level reading and we don't. We, our mission is to disrupt generational poverty. Because truth be told, a large and growing number of children, even before the pandemic, were falling beyond the reach of schools. Um, and we know who these children are. They're the children who start school already so far behind that they may never catch up. They're the children who are absent from school so often and they miss so much instruction that they fall behind during the school year. And as you mentioned, they're the children who experience the summer slide and lose ground over the summer and often return to school in the fall farther behind than when they left in June. And these, for the most part, are not three groups of students. These are the same student. The same student who starts out behind is likely to be the same student that is chronically absent and falls farther behind during the school year and is often likely to be the same student that will lose ground over the summer and return to school the following year even farther behind. And what we know about these children, for the most part, these are children who were born into poverty and who will spend most of their young years in poverty and who will as teens and young adults have children of their own who will repeat the cycle. And the tragedy is, the tragedy is that level of generational po poverty is lamentable and preventable. Mm. We know what we need to do and we don't do, do it. You know, um, Ron Haskins and Bell Sawhill. It's now been more than a decade since their book on opportunity came out. And they said, look, there are three things we need to do to stop young people from falling into poverty. One, we need to get them to graduate from high school. And I would quickly add with a meaningful diploma. Uh, two, we need them to get and hold on to a job. And I would add a, a, a job that pays a living wage. And three, we need to encourage them to delay pregnancy and parenting until they're 25 years old or married. Now, as soon as we say the third, everybody sparks and begins a debate about that. And then when the economy is bad and parents can't find a job, it seems as if number two is a little bit a reach too far 
for young children, for young kids just graduating from high school. But the fact of the matter is, we don't get to number two and number three because so many kids whose families are economically challenged are not graduating from high school in the first place. So we looked at these data and said, if we want to begin to change and prevent children from falling into poverty, the first thing we've got to do is get them to graduate from high school. And then we look for an inflection point and, 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 and Terry, you know this because you were among the people who were pushing us to, to this. And the inflection point the research tells us is third grade reading. That children who read proficiently at the end of third grade tend to graduate from high school and children who do not read proficiently by the end of third grade don't graduate from high school. And so we honed in on third grade reading, not because it was magic, but because it was predictive, strongly correlated and even predictive of high school graduation. And then we said, what do we know about kids who don't, who don't read proficiently at third grade? What we know is that kids who start school far behind and that raises the school readiness and the opportunity gap issue. There are kids who in fact are missing too much school and they have the chronic absence issue. And they're the kids who are experiencing the summer slide and there's the summer learning loss issues. And we honed in on these three. And I've got to tell you that telling communities that there's something they can do about issues about which they care has talismanic power because we were in an era in 2010 when the partisanship led to paralysis and gridlock and people were frustrated of being told that they couldn't solve problems. And we entered into that era with an enabling message and said, you may not be able to solve every problem, but we in our communities can commit with resolve to get kids reading on third grade. And if we're gonna do that, we're gonna to have to get more kids ready, more kids showing up and, more, and take care of more kids over the summer. And communities across the, the country, and I think we have a map that will show the 350 communities in 45 states, District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, US Virgin Islands, and two provinces in Canada are all part of this network. And I can say, and I say this even when I'm not in Iowa, that one of the brightest stars uh, in our campaign is the Iowa campaign for grade level reading. And I am so pleased uh, to ask Becky to share a little bit with you about what's happening right here in Iowa. Becky, will you please? Sure. And um, Mike, could you pull up the map um, that Ralph was referring to so we can get a quick look at the national scale of this? And Ralph, I don't know if you might want a couple comments before I go to my Iowa slides. Well, well you know, what I've got to say is that one of these days we're gonna pull this map up because we're bragging and then we will uh, claim uh, that this was really the plan all along. And if I do that, um, and if you see, if you hear there's a report saying that, look for it in the fiction uh, aisle of your local library or bookstore, because this is as much a surprise to us as it, as it is to anybody else. We have been uh, simply delighted and sometimes overwhelmed by the way this message resonated with communities all across the country who again decided that this was a problem uh, about which they were concerned and they were deeply appreciative and responsive to the fact that we managed to identify 
three, four, five, six things that they could do about that. And, they're, and they've been doing it and doing it really well uh, over the last uh, six, eight years. And in some, some, the full decade, because some started even before we did. So that was, that's what I would say. Uh, we're proud of this map. Uh, we are surprised by it, uh, but are delighted that the message has found such support and resonance. Thanks, thanks so much. Mike, do you want, uh, could you switch to the Iowa slides for me? Um, as Ralph said, we're also surprised and delighted about the um, about the work in Iowa. And um, when the campaign launched in uh, 2011, uh, officially, uh, we had six communities. And Mike, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, that were part of that inaugural cohort of what then was, I think, around 124 communities, Ralph. And um, since that time, um, we have expanded um, more than doubled that number. And you can see across the state, um, we have 15 communities total and two uh, bi-state efforts, um, one in uh, the Quad Cities area. And I think I saw my colleague Alex Kochler on um, from the Quad Cities United Way. And then the uh, Omaha Council Bluffs metro area um, has also Council Bluffs was one of the inaugural cities in Iowa, and then Omaha has recently come on board. Um, and you can see that in that geographic footprint, we have um, 58 school districts that are also represented by the communities and, and counties that are served in the Iowa campaign. And Mike, we can go to the next slide. And um, as you can see, uh, with that geographic footprint, we have the opportunity to reach over half of the low-income kids who are birth to age eight in Iowa. And each of the communities has put a stake in the ground around um, working with school districts, um, working with other partners to ensure that we get low-income kids reading by the time that they leave third grade on the track to inter, uh, interrupt this generational poverty that Ralph was speaking about. We have a whole host of volunteers that have been part of the efforts in, in these communities and private philanthropy, including community foundations, family foundations and United Way. Um, this is a, uh, an estimate and it's a low estimate, but we know um, have, have supported with um, tens of millions of dollars um, these efforts. And uh, you can see we have a, a good number of partners in the philanthropic um, community that are part of our uh, efforts in each of these communities. And then finally, we'll take a look at this last slide, which can be um, a depressing slide to look at. Um, and I think it's part of the reason that we're having this conversation today. Um, the NAEP test is a test that's um, administered in all 50 states. And while it doesn't tell the whole story about what's happening in Iowa, you can see that um, over the past decade, we've had very little change in the number uh, and percent of low-income children who are reading proficiently by the time that they take this test in fourth grade. And this is, you know, this is the, the epidemic that was in place before. We have the pandemic layered on it now. And so we have bright spots certainly across the state and, and the work that, um, um, the public sector has been doing to support um, children reading. Um, you know, we've had considerable investment in the public sector as well. Lots of work going on from teachers, but we have a lot of work to do yet. Um, and so we're excited to be part of the national campaign, working side by side with with Ralph and um, the you know nearly 400 other communities around the country that um, are working together. So with that, um, Terry, um, are we ready to move on to some questions for Ralph? I think so. Do you want to uh, kick it off? Sure. Um, we talked a little bit, Ralph, you, you mentioned, and Terry, you mentioned as well, this, this issue of the summer slide. And that's been something that we focused on, you know, diligently for the past decade with our communities. And now we're layering on the COVID slide with this. Um, and Ralph, I know you've been in conversations with all kinds of national colleagues, as well as leaders in states and communities around the country 
I wonder if you could give us just a little bit of a sense of what you're learning in those conversations. How, how deep do you think this slide is going to go and what are some of the promising practices that you're seeing on the horizon? Um, you know, you're both um, quite right to be very concerned about this COVID slide. And it's important for me to say at the outset that the decision to close schools based on what we knew then was uh, reasonable uh, and wise decision that probably saved lives. And there is on my part, no second guessing that initial decision. But the school closures had an unintended consequence and that unintended consequence was adding a disaster to a disaster. Uh, the pandemic is by any stretch of the imagination a disaster and, and without any stretch of the imagination a disaster. What we now see happening is a less visible but potentially catastrophic disaster and that is the amount of learning loss being experienced by so many kids across the country. And like the virus itself, while it is indiscriminate, it also is most lethal for folks with pre-existing conditions. Uh, learning loss is most profoundly difficult and consequential for children for, with, from economically challenged families, uh, children with parents who have to work because they're the informal economy or the essential economy, children with parents whose language is not uh, first language is not English. Uh, children uh, whose parents are homeless uh, or housing insecure or food insecure at the particular um, moment. But most of all, children from economically challenge families who are already experiencing the adversity of poverty. And those families that are most disconnected, whether they're rural communities or urban neighborhoods, those families that are disconnected from the internet, which became the immediate alternative. We've had children who have had no school and nothing that could pass for schools since last February. That is puts the summer learning loss issue on steroids. Hmm. This, is ex this is especially a problem for children in the early grades. And what we know is that with one, two and possibly three years of disruption these children would have experienced learning loss that will be unlike anything we've ever seen and will require a different set of interventions. For those of us who've seen disasters, what we know is that the early stages of the response are about rescue and relief, and then comes recovery. So is it with this particular issue. Schools are uh, trying to figure out how to feed students, how to provide a set of services, uh, how to open uh, safely for both the children and the adults. And so in many respects, school systems have not gotten to the issue of how we repair 
and recover from, from learning loss. That will come probably in another year, 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 year and a half. By that time, some children may be irretrievably lost. So what do we do in the interim? And that's where the campaign has pivoted to say we cannot wait uh, another year, two years. We've got to start now. And you know, my grandmother, and I always attribute this to my grandmother, I'm not sure she ever said uh, that. Hey, how are you? Good, how are you? I, I'm not sure she no? ever said uh, that when you're in a hole, you stop digging, Thank you. but I like it. And right now, what we've got to do is to work on slowing and stopping learning loss. And we've got to slow and stop learning loss by making sure that all children and households are connected to the internet, making sure that children have the tutorial support that they need, making sure that parents are equipped and supported in succeeding in the job that's been thrust upon them. We've got to not only slow and stop learning loss, we've got to begin the plans for learning loss recovery, and we've got to begin those plans now, not wait until three years from now. And we've also got to figure out how communities can own the broader responsibility for, for children learning and can step up and create in all places and spaces, formal and informal, uh, the opportunity for children as, they've, as families visit the laundromat, the market, as we go, whenever we get back to barbershops and beauty salons and the like, that wherever children and parents are, that they become, whether playgrounds or sidewalks or whatever, become places where children, they become learning rich environment and places where ch parents and children could learn together. That uh, three part strategy, slow and stop learning loss, begin planning now for recovery, and stepping up as a community to share the responsibility and the burden of making every place and making an entire community a place where ch children can learn. That's our job right now. And the campaign has been working real hard to get the message out and find ways to support communities in doing that. So Ralph, you've touched on this just a little bit, but I'd like to go um, just a little deeper about the role of schools um, in community. You know, there was a time when we thought that schools were just a place for kids to learn, and now they've turned into so much more than that. Um, we've got dental clinics in our schools. We've got medical facilities in our schools. We've got access to food. We've got social workers. We've got people from A to Z working not only with our students, but also our families. But let's talk about the implications of that loss when we now no longer have kids who are physically in buildings and the implication of schools no longer being able to be that service point, if you will, uh, for so many families that are in need. Let's talk about how that really impacts our ability to serve families in a way that not only continues to lift them, but also serves the needs of students and teachers at the same time. T Terry, you know, as, as you do, what you're inviting us to do is to blow up the current notion we have of school. When we, see, when we say school and see school, we're generally thinking of a, of a, of a place where education happens, where teaching and learning happens. But what the pandemic has helped to illuminate is that schools are so much more than that. School, schools are the major social service 
organization in our communities. And that's one of the reasons why closing schools that are not working for education proves so difficult in many communities because the educators that say this school is not working, but they completely miss the fact that that school is more than an education facility. It is a social service agency. It is the point of contact for, mo for most families and kids in that neighborhood. Another way to look at school, uh, Terry, is that we all know that the child care system for young kids has, is in serious trouble and needs to be rescued. Why? Because we realize that the child care system is an essential uh, component of the economy. Parents can't work if, if they don't have child care. But what we don't quite wrap our arms around is that we need safe custodial childcare for school age kids. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we have it. It's called school. And when we close schools, the economy stops also. So we need to, in many respects, erase this distinction we have between childcare and school and realize that we need safe, custodial, developmentally appropriate custodial care for all kids from birth to 18. And that that responsibility is shared by a vibrant, entrepreneurial childcare system. And it's served in large part by our what we hope will become a vibrant public school system. And if we see these, this is a continuum of safe, developmentally appropriate custodial care, we think of schools differently. And then the issue, as you say, when we close schools, we realize there's not just, uh, we're not just interrupting education, we are disrupting the system of support that we have for families across the community. And as we've just demonstrated, we're disrupting the economy. So we need to come back uh, with a far more realistic understanding of what school is. And that's gonna lead to a more complicated approach to uh, resolving the issue of learning loss. And it explains why learning loss may be so much more difficult for people to wrap their heads around. Because first, first thing, just think, and I'm sure Iowa was not different from any place else. During the first two weeks, the major challenge for schools was how to feed kids. And the debates across the nation were, well, are we gonna do feeding stations? Are we gonna do grab and goes? Are we gonna get kids? That was the debate, forget about learning. It was about food. And that was not a bad priority, but it should help us understand that trying to go back to the old concept we have at school isn't the way to go. You know, we that has now been blown up and we now have to take a kind of a mature approach to what this institution means and how much we attention we need to pay to it and how much we need to invest in, in, in that place called school, invest in terms of talent, invest in terms of time, and invest in terms of dollars. We have to have a very different conversation in the communities in which we live. And for that, may be one of the legacies of COVID that we might want to look back on and say, were it not for COVID, we would still be thinking about schools in a way that underfunds, undervalues, and over time makes them not effective of doing any of the things we want them to do. Thank you. Becky? Ralph, um, you and I have talked about this and uh, Terry and I and certainly lots of others um, around the impact of 
on, on parents and kids' mental health during this pandemic. Um, and it's not been kind. It's been especially hard, I think, for families um, who are living in poverty. The stressors are just um, compounded there. I wonder if you could speak a little bit about um, how do we encourage communities and schools to uh, embrace social emotional well being and learning um, for kids and for families? Well, let me. Uh respond to that a little bit elliptically, Becky, because I, this is one of the places I want to uh, point out that schools are part of the informal surveillance system we have to protect children from abuse and neglect. This is why in most states and jurisdiction, teachers are mandated reporters that there is, uh, we assume that there is at least one and probably more responsible adults who have seen children every day and who are charged with paying attention to the health and well-being of their kids. Now that's one of the things that we don't, we have not surfaced. But when I was in Philadelphia some time ago, and I don't know if it's changed, the reports of suspected neglect and abuse filed by teachers increased dramatically in May and June because teachers were, were concerned that this kid who they, thought, who they had some concerns about was gonna be for two months or three months without any adult being able to observe and or intervene. And they would file reports in May and June as a way of protecting kids. So when we take, when we close schools, we have removed from the equation thousands and across, <laughs> across the country, million people who are part of that child protection surveillance system. And that there are consequences to that is not at all surprising. And then we create a situation where kids are at home, uh, regardless of uh, economic class, uh, with adults who themselves are stressed. Um, and and adults who are stressed and off, and sometimes without help. And this is where the resources that are available uh, based on class and income becomes really important because there are lots of adults who have the resources and they've hired teachers and they've formed pods and they have found ways to structure the situation uh, to provide some um, normalcy uh, for, for their children, but that's the uh, minority of parents. The majority of parents, and, and certainly the overwhelming majority of parents who are economically challenged, have to make do with what they have. And what they have, especially if they live in, live in neighborhoods of concentrated poverty, especially if they live in neighborhoods where the, and communities where they're stressors, they are less capable of managing those stresses 24 seven with their kids at home than they were before schools closed. So it's unsurprising that as we have seen and suspect an increase in family violence and in, in family violence, as we have seen and uh, monitoring um, an increase in reported family dysfunctions that there will be a, a fairly substantial increase in the number of kids who are in a situation where this social and emotional well-being is not being fully protected and is probably at significantly higher risk and getting even worse as this situation gets prolonged. And that's why you saw me 
make a distinction about the initial decision to close schools. And it may ver very well be that the scale has tilted and that those of us who care about the well-being of kids now ought to be on the other side of that and really um, actively engage in the discussion of how we reopen schools in a way that's safe for the children and safe for the adults who we want to care for and about them. Thank you, thank you for that. I wanted to just give a little bit of a bright spot um, that's happening in central Iowa around this um, social emotional well-being in particular and, and to say that um, philanthropy has an important role to play in these spaces and the Iowa Council of Foundations has been a key partner um, with the campaign for grade level reading in Iowa um, for six plus years now. And um, one of the stellar members of ICOF and one of our own Central Iowa Foundations, the Mid-Iowa Health Foundation, has, has um, brought um, to Central Iowa a par partnership with Sesame Street and Communities. And you'll all be hearing more about that over the next few months, um, which we're focusing specifically on social and emotional well-being for children. And um, hold the date on your calendars for January 27th from noon to one. Um, we're going to have um, a town hall, virtual town hall with Sesame Street that day. So uh, we're looking forward to that. So Terry, I'm gonna toss it back to you now. Great, thank you, Becky. And um, I'm so excited about the work um, that Mid-Iowa Health and Sesame Street and so many people are doing because we know the importance of not only addressing the issues of social emotional health, but also the needs of our youngest children as Ralph has already uh, witnessed and shared with us uh, today. Um, we're gonna move into uh, my last question, but I'm encouraging those of you that may have questions in the audience to share those um, in the chat. And we'll try to capture a few of those before we close out this afternoon. Um, but Ralph, I have always known you to be both a realist and an eternal optimist. And um, in closing, uh, would you be willing to share or talk about uh, bright spots that you're seeing, some best practices that we uh, are seeing out in um, the communities where you're working? Any takeaways, um, lessons learned that are resulting um, as a result of the pandemic that uh, will pave the way to um, a brighter future and create opportunities for us to learn from what we've experienced over the course of the last several months. Oh. Ralph, you're on mute. There you go. Thank you. You know, I thought I would actually get through one webinar without hearing that, Ralph, you are on mute. And I almost, <laughs> I almost did it, almost. Uh, th that's a really challenging uh, question, Terry. But before I answer it, let me say, uh, having been on webinars, I know there are several people who have put questions in the chat box and I'll make a commitment to you and a commitment to Becky that the questions in the chat box, if you record them and, and get them to me, we will uh, answer them and then you, you can figure out how to get back to the people who are online. And because I know that people are asking questions and in an hour, we can't get to the questions, uh, but I wanna be respectful of the people who have given their time. And if you put a question in that chat box, if I can, if I can have an answer or find an answer, we'll get back to you promise. Now, with respect um, to your questions, we're seeing some, we're seeing across the country, um, the folks that people are inventing, inventing. Uh, remember in Oakland, where early in the process, and I think it was Oakland, where they began to use school buses as, as hotspots. And that spread all across the country vi virally. It went across the country. Uh, so we have found a number of ways that folks are inventing and innovating to deal with the problems. In San Francisco, they have set up 
and in many other cities, they have set up um, learning support centers where if a school closes, that the parent doesn't have to stay home, that there's a neighborhood support center where the kid can go, where adults have been trained, where teachers are stationed, that have uh, workstations so that the kid can work in their cubicles uh, that have been cleaned and sanitized and whatnot in a safe, healthy environment to continue to continue their learning. We've seen in a number of cities, uh, philanthropic organizations come together and provide the bridge funding to so that internet uh, access will be assured. We're seeing across the country efforts uh, to expand uh, uh, access to tutors. In fact, in some places you have high school students that have set up little tutoring co collaboratives and they've made themselves available to students in uh, ele ele elementary schools. Uh, we're, we're seeing uh, lots and lots of uh, uh, energy around uh, how to feed students. We're seeing uh, PBS stations and public television is one of the unsung heroes of uh, this effort. And because we've all switched our attention to online and the internet, uh, but along the way, we still have broadcast media especially uh, PBS and Univision, uh, both essentially creating uh, inventive programming to hold the, atten uh, hold the attention of uh, children all day. We have seen um, teachers and parents both do heroic things, and we've seen parents and teachers come to really appreciate their respective roles. And there are parents who are saying, you know, I'm just dealing with one or two kids. I can't imagine what it must be like dealing with 25 or 30 kids all day long. And you're seeing teachers who themselves are trying to be good teachers, even as they've got their own kids uh, to deal with, who are appreciating the challenges that parents face day in and day out. And they are wonderful stories to tell. In fact, we're hoping to get StoryCorps to tell some of those stories where teachers and parents have now come to appreciate in a way they had not before their respective roles and the fact that they are essential partners and neither one can succeed well with, 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 without the other. And those relationships, but we've also seen that those schools that had a respectful ongoing relationship with families before the pandemic are my most successful schools because they are trusted relationships. There were open lines of communication and those kids are not falling off the grid. In this, to the same extent as we've got others doing. So it's been this notion of paying attention to the relationship between schools and community, between schools and families, between teachers and parents. That notion that many of us have talked about for years has been validated as essential to success, is gonna be essential to slowing, to stopping and it's gonna be essential to the recovery from learning loss. So there's a whole lot about which to be optimistic if we adopt um, the president-elect's admonition uh, to build back better. Mm -hmm. And it's us holding ourselves accountable for seeing this moment of disruption um, as we work our way through it uh, as pointing us in a direction where we can reinvent, reinvent and reimagine uh, school 
and see it as part of the longer system of providing a safe, healthy, developmentally appropriate custodial care, uh, which allows uh, caring adults to take care of kids while uh, uh, par parents work. And I'm I, I, um, terribly optimistic, very optimistic that coming out of this era, whenever we come out of this, that we have the potential to build something uh, that's better than we had when we went in. If we commit to doing it and if we take on uh, poverty, not as an esoteric issue, but as a real issue uh, and see poverty as the driver, as the root cause and of the, as the super spreader of the inequities uh, that we have been exposed by COVID. Thank you, Ralph. I love that Build Back Better. And I think that there's no better place for us to think about doing that uh, than in our systems of education. Absolutely. So um, let me just share uh, one question from the audience, and then we will make sure that we get the rest of the questions to Ralph so that he can respond accordingly. Uh, but this individual is looking to plan for summer. Um, she's part of a program that um, already does work with students in the summer to address summer slide. She's wondering if there are key features of programming that should be considered as they plan not only for summer slide, but to address the effects now of COVID slide, specific things that they should be doing in their program. There's a report that just came out last week. It's the report from McKinsey and Company. Um, they uh, take a look at all the data, but they've done a really good job of looking at some solutions. And the two solutions that they looked at uh, were, you know, uh, increasing tutoring and making a better use and more effective use of summer. And they have really, in a few pages, uh, really condensed not only the best practices, but the most promising models, uh, the things that show the most, of, uh, the most impact and the largest effects in dealing with summer. So I would commend uh, that report and it's easy to find, go to their website, put in uh, lessons from COVID and their December report will, will, is right on point with that question. Great, thank you. Thank you, Ralph. And um, again, for those of you that also had questions, we will make sure we get those to Ralph. We are about ready to wrap up, but before I do, let me thank my co-facilitator, uh, Becky, my dear friend, Becky, uh, for joining me today. And Ralph, uh, thank you so much for joining us again virtually here in the state of Iowa. Uh, you've been a wealth of knowledge and um, just thank you for sharing that with us as you always do, profound, prolific and always, always on point. So thank you, Ralph. Well, thank you for being my inspiration over the decades, Terry. And I'm delighted to be back in Iowa with you. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to now very quickly remind everybody, uh, we will have our next conversation uh, in February, which is African American History Month. And uh, Ralph Smith was kind enough to connect me with Michael McAfee who is the president and CEO of PolicyLink. Uh, Michael will be joining us to not only talk about African-American History Month, but to share his knowledge and the work that he's done across the country uh, in a variety of areas. It's um, for sure going to be, again, a bright spot in our conversation, just like today has been. So please plan to join us on February 25th at 1 p.m. for our next Conversation in Color featuring Michael McAfee. Thank you everybody for joining us. We always appreciate uh, you taking time out of your schedule for these conversations in color. Thank you again to our sponsor, the ITA group, and of course our co-host for today's conversation of the Greater Des Moines Partnership. Merry Christmas, happy holidays, happy Hanukkah, happy um, Kwanzaa, uh, whatever you celebrate, please celebrate in good cheer. Uh, thank you so much, and uh, we'll see you in February. Take care.